1999, a wave of bloody explosions swept through Russian cities. On the 4th of September, in Bunaksk, in Dagestan, 62 people died in the rubble of a tower block. On the night of the 9th of September, in Moscow, an eight-story apartment building in Gurianov Street was blown to bits. A toll of 94 dead and 164 wounded. At dawn on the 13th of September in the capital city again, a powerful explosion totally destroyed a seven-story building on the Kashira Road. 119 bodies were pulled from the rubble. They included 12 children. Three days later, in Volgodonsk in southern Russia, 17 people died in another explosion. Russia had never before been subjected to such acts of terrorism. Mass psychosis quickly set in. All offices and non-residential premises, cellars and basements were thoroughly checked. Civilians volunteered to patrol courtyards, stairways and landings. A multitude of checkpoints paralyzed road transport. Responsibility for the attacks has never been claimed, but from day one, the secret services put the blame squarely on the Chechens. The people who organize these missions, who prepare the explosives, who deliver them, and have overall responsibility for everything that has happened are obviously in Chechnya. I can tell you with the utmost certainty, I can guarantee you that they come from the training camps of Khatab and Basayev. After a three-year truce in Chechnya, the war had now moved to the heart of Russia. With public anger running so high, the Prime Minister Vladimir Putin ordered a bombing campaign to bring the rebellious Chechens to heel. Russian planes are only striking the terrorist bases. We will follow the terrorists wherever they go. If they are at the airport, we will be there. Excuse me, but if they're in the toilets, we will go in there and blow them away. That's all there is to it. The problem is solved. When the first explosions took place in Moscow, then in Volgodonsk, the public was in a state of stupefaction and shock. This coincided with the appointment of Putin as Prime Minister. And I think that then about 90 to 95 percent of people, just like today in America, supported the action the president was taking to eliminate the Chechen bans. But what's interesting is that even now it hasn't been proved that the Chechens did it. Okay, so the finger is pointing at a whole people, the Chechens. But show me who carried out the attack, show me who planted the bombs. They can't do it. The slow progress of the inquiries, the absence of proof, the sheer scale and professionalism of the bombings all cast doubt on Chechen involvement. Speculation as to the possible involvement of the Lubyanka, the secret services, began to emerge. To judge from the consequences, and they say that in politics you should always look to see who benefits, then of course there are all sorts of different versions. But the public is still very interested in the role played by the special services in all of this. After public demands for peace, the enraged Russian people turned against the Chechens and the war was renewed. There's little doubt that it was the toughened public opinion that put the young hardliner Vladimir Putin, the former head of the Secret Service, the FSB, into the Kremlin. To this day, the only terrorists detected in connection with the bombings were FSB agents. The first suspicions of special service involvement in the bombings came after three explosions had already claimed more than 300 lives. 
It was then, on the 22nd of September 1999, that a bomb attack was apparently averted in Ryazan. It was officially passed off as a civil defense exercise, using a mock-up device. But many Russians believe the bomb was real. To them, President Putin's rise to power is now seen in a very different light. Those involved in investigating the mysterious events in Ryazan include journalists from Novaya Gazeta, one of Moscow's last remaining independent publications. And since the FSB doesn't like it when people pry, the newspaper has had more than its fair share of problems. We consider that, according to the law, according to the Russian penal code as it stands, the facts disclosed by our paper should lead to the opening of a criminal inquiry to establish if those facts are indeed well-founded. But instead of that, a slander suit has been brought against the paper. In August 2001, Novaya Gazeta took a risk when it published extracts from a book by Yuri Felstinsky and Alexander Litvinenko, The FSB Bombs Russia. The historian Yuri Felstinsky was born in Moscow and since 1978 has lived and worked in the United States. He has written several books on the history of the USSR. An American citizen, he was the first foreigner to obtain a Russian doctorate in history. We all know that information often comes out after failed operations. That's what's happened here. The FSB tried and failed to blow up a building in Ryazan. The details are clear enough now to make it a textbook case. We know everything. What car they came in, how many of them there were, when and how they planted the bomb. We even know what time it should have gone off. And it can hardly be a coincidence that these attacks stopped after the bungling of Ryazan. It would have been stupid to carry on with a flawed battle plan. The NTV television channel, then still independent, took an interest in the Ryazan case. In March 2000, it broadcast an open debate with everyone involved in the affair in its show, Independent Inquiry. Thanks to these images, which strangely enough have neither been seized nor destroyed, we can reconstruct what really happened in Ryazan. On the 22nd of September, at 10 past 9 in the evening, a suspicious scene was played out in front of an apartment building. Two men and a woman unloaded three large bags from the boot of a white car and carried them into a basement. A second suspicious point was that the number 62, indicating a Ryazan vehicle registration, was written on a piece of card and taped over the car's real number. I drove straight past them, but I went back to look at the rear number plate, too. And sure enough, it was the same. A piece of paper with 62 on it, taped over the end of the registration number. It made me suspicious, so when I got home, I called the police. A patrol car arrived at the scene one hour later. The car had gone, but the police made an important discovery in the basement of the building. Three large 50-kilo bags and a homemade detonator programmed for 5.30. The patrol chief was Andrei Chernyshev. Pavel Voloshin, a Novaya Gazeta journalist, met him soon afterwards. He told me he was sure it was a serious situation. He'd seen the bags, a wire coming out of the bags, and there was a detonator. He was sure he had prevented an attack, and that, thanks to Kartofelnikov's phone call, hundreds of lives had been saved. On the NTV program, the tenants of the building recounted the details of what they saw and went through that night. 
When the police went down to the basement, they weren't very enthusiastic because it's in a terrible state and some people use it as a toilet. But when they came back up, the expressions on their faces were very different. The cops were running all over the building, banging on doors and shouting, everybody out, there's a bomb in the building. After what had happened in Moscow and other places, everyone went down into the street in their dressing gowns and slippers. We've got a three-year-old. We grabbed him out of the bath, soaking wet. We wrapped him up in a towel, put our heads down and ran. I got there at 10.15 that evening. I brought all the people who live in the building together and told them we've checked the basement and the attics. The building is safe. And I told them, as head of the local FSB, you can go back to your homes. This is the first statement by Sergeyev to contradict the facts. The tenants actually spent the whole night in a nearby cinema. The inspection of the buildings was taken so seriously that they couldn't go back to their homes until the following morning. We weren't allowed back in and the police stayed in the building until 10 o'clock in the morning. They led us away at 2 o'clock. I noted down a quarter past midnight. We were taken to the October cinema. There was no heating. It was freezing for the children. Well, I was there with you. We were all there in the October cinema. There's no point in lying. Maintaining a false version of events is always difficult. Not long before this clash, General Sergeyev had been telling a completely different story. I was with you all night. I worked with you until morning. We spoke to each other. And yes, the situation was certainly serious. On the night itself, the former head of the Ryazan office of the FSB was as certain as anyone else that there had been a bomb in the building. Sergeyev came over to us several times. Around two o'clock in the morning, when the bags had been checked, he got us all together in a circle around him and said, today is your second birthday. There were three bags of explosive programmed to go off at half past five. You would have all been there and you would all have been blown sky high. From this statement made on the night by the local head of the FSB, it was clear to all that a real bomb had been diffused. There were three bags. The one in the middle had a hole in it. There was an electronic watch inside with wires coming off it. I put my hands in and started gently taking the wires out of the bag. This photo of the detonator was taken the next day, the 23rd of September. As for the bags, analysis revealed traces of hexagen, an extremely powerful explosive. Acting on the experts' conclusions, on the night of the 23rd of September, the Ryazan public prosecutor ordered criminal proceedings to be instigated in accordance with Article 205 of the Penal Code, terrorism. 1,200 police officers and soldiers were thrown into the hunt for the bombers. Their identical pictures were pasted all over town and distributed to all police patrols. There were two men, one with a mustache and a woman in a tracksuit. She was sitting in the back. On the evening of the 23rd of September, Prime Minister Putin announced to the world, as far as the events in Ryazan are concerned, I don't think they made some kind of cock up. If these sacks with the explosives were noticed, that means there is at least one plus factor that the public is reacting in the right way to the events taking place in our country today. In this way, Putin confirmed that a terrorist attack really had been thwarted in Ryazan. The Ryazan telephone exchanges had been put on red alert. The telephonist, Nadezhda Yuknova, intercepted a suspicious call to Moscow. The number that was dialed began with 224, which is the exchange that services the Lubyanka, the FSB headquarters. They said, is the woman with you? No, she's taking the trolley bus at noon. Where's the car? 
The cars in the car park, leave Ryazan separately. There are checkpoints and patrols everywhere. And I mean, anyone would have thought, because everyone was thinking about terrorism. Thanks to that phone call just 24 hours after the discovery of the bomb, the police had already located the suspect's hideout. But then something quite inexplicable happened. On the same day, the 24th of September, two government ministers speaking half an hour apart in the same place made two completely contradictory statements. Vladimir Rachelo, Minister of the Interior, categorically stated that there had been a failed terrorist attack in Ryazan. Positive measures are already being taken. One example is the prevention of an explosion in an apartment building in Ryazan. But then Nikolai Patrushev, director of the SFB, immediately contradicted his colleague. First of all, there wasn't an explosion. And an explosion wasn't prevented. But it wasn't good work. It was an exercise. There were no explosives, just sugar. The fact that Interior Minister Rushailo apparently knew of no such exercise could suggest that a real bombing had been thwarted. Several months later, during an NTV broadcast, an FSB spokesman stressed the official line. It had been an exercise. But he let slip that it was a joint exercise between the FSB and the local police. The exercise order, he said, had been signed by both ministries. A major operation involving all the members of the Russian Federation was jointly planned by the police and the FSB. The operation was codenamed Anti-Terror Whirlwind. It was signed by Petrushev and Rushailo. Even high-ranking Secret Service officers had difficulty supporting the exercise version of events. I don't get it. Why did it take two whole days to tell the world it was an exercise? Frankly, it's incomprehensible. Well, it's obvious. We wanted to check the logical follow-through of our operation, including the hunt methods for terrorists. That's why we didn't reveal it was an exercise. Right, but you couldn't have told Rochelle? Well, you know, things can sometimes get muddled during an exercise. Anyway, during the exercise, we were checking our systems and the systems of the Interior Ministry. Well, can you believe this? Rushailo says it was a great achievement, and half an hour later, Patrushev says, oh no, it was just an exercise. But Vladimir Putin found himself in an even more awkward position. He had also announced that a bombing had been thwarted. Had the Prime Minister known about the exercises in Ryazan? The notion that until Patrushev's announcement on the 24th of September, Prime Minister Putin didn't know about any exercise being held in Russia is improbable. If that was the case, Putin would have had to sack Patrushev the moment he heard that the exercise was being held in Ryazan. Because it would have meant that Patrushev had not only misled the whole country, but Putin too. Patrushev didn't lose his job. So Putin must have known that Patrushev was holding an exercise in Ryazan on the blowing up of an apartment block. The members of the Ryazan FSB were not informed about the operation run from Moscow because of the need for secrecy. But they had seen with their own eyes that the detonator and the explosives were genuine. They found themselves in a very tricky situation. To put it mildly, Sergeyev wasn't pleased. In fact, he was beside himself with rage. After all, in this case, his professional pride as a member of the special services had been trampled in the dirt. How could an FSB general not know what was going on in his own patch? Even worse, now the Moscow bosses were trying to force the local Ryazan FSB to change their game completely. And then, to cover themselves and separate themselves from the actions of the center, the local Secret Service men published an absolutely unique statement. I would say this document is concrete proof of the involvement of the FSB in the Ryazan attack. I'm going to read these few lines from the Ryazan FSB statement. 
It has been made known that an imitation detonator, discovered on the 22nd of September, was part of a joint operation. This announcement came as a surprise to us. It came out just as our agents had identified the place where the bombers were living in Ryazan and were preparing to arrest them. It was precisely at this moment that Patrushev replaced the real attack story with the exercise theory. Just hours after the Ryazan incident, Alexander Zdanovich had appeared on Hero of the Day on NTV. But he didn't mention an exercise. His accusers say that either the excuse hadn't yet been conjured up, or he was buying time for the Moscow FSB bombers to escape. But he was already downplaying the Ryazan affair. According to the information currently in my possession, no explosives were discovered. Even the reports that came out on the morning, supposedly analyzing hexogen fumes or hexogen, haven't been confirmed by our specialists. And the detonator? You know there weren't any detonators. There were things that only looked a bit like a remote control or several components of an explosive device. But many of the tenants of the building had seen the contents of the bags that were planted in their basement, and the substance did not resemble sugar. I saw those bags lying there, no more than 10 feet away. They looked like, I don't know, maybe it wasn't hexogen that was in them, but to start with, it was yellowish and really fine, like chopped vermicelli, some kind of granules, I'd say. I can assure you with total confidence that there wasn't any hexogen. And, by the way, to go back to the explosions that happened in Moscow and other cities, there was no hexogen there either. A quite different explosive was used. Six months earlier, the leaders of the FSB had said something entirely different about the explosions in Moscow. We have received new information that traces of hexogen and TNT were discovered. This already indicates that the explosion was definitely not an accident. So why did the FSB suddenly start denying that hexogen had been used in other bomb massacres? It's alleged this was to eliminate the similarities between the real bombings and the so-called exercise in Ryazan. At various different stages, the discovery of the explosive and the gas, the analysis, the panic, the FSB had several opportunities to make a prompt announcement that this was an exercise. Why was that not done? Because the FSB didn't think anyone would pick up the trail. Just at the moment when the terrorists were about to be arrested in Ryazan, when the people and their hiding place had been identified, at that moment Patrushev announced that there was an exercise going on. And so the announcement by Patrushev himself that exercises were going on in Ryazan was, of course, an indication that the terrorist attack had been planned from the top and with Patrushev's knowledge. In order to support their exercise explanation, the FSB produced an agent who'd been involved. The public was presented with a back-to-camera interview of a special services officer. Following orders issued by my superiors at the FSB, as the first step in Operation Anti-Terror Whirlwind, our group was instructed to go to Ryazan to carry out a mission. And that's what we did. We bought sugar and made an imitation detonator. The three bags of sugar were purchased at the local market. In order to lend the exercise version credibility, the leaders of the FSB appealed to veterans from its own special units to put on a show of corporate solidarity. 
Putin has said there are no ex-secret service agents. That's simply the kind of people we are, and no matter what happens, we never retire. The special services veterans were poorly rehearsed for the press conference. Or perhaps they simply learned their lines badly. They deliberately pasted over the front plate, like the paper said, and wrote the number in ink. They deliberately didn't paste over the back number because it might attract attention. I went back to have a look at the rear number plate, and sure enough it was the same, a piece of paper with 62 on it, taped over the end of the registration number. Our FSB officers went down there and worked out why the sample analysed had indicated the presence of an explosive. The kind of instrument used for analysis has to be absolutely sterile. But there was old sample material still in it. But what does practically no explosives mean? The FSB claimed the analysis was tainted, maybe to cast doubt on the first analysis of the sack's contents by local explosives expert Yuri Kachenko. Kachenko himself was very amused by the statements from the FSB Public Relations Center that his hands and the test instrument were tainted and that he hadn't washed the instrument down. According to Kachenko, that kind of instrument should never be washed. In the numerous interviews with the Vimpo FSB groups who supposedly took part in the operation, not even the times of their arrival added up. They claimed to have left Moscow on the evening of the same day. But anyone who's traveled from Moscow to Ryazan by car knows that it's physically impossible, whatever speed you're going at, to get to Ryazan so quickly as to have the time to buy sugar in the local market. The FSB claimed the sugar had been bought in the evening. But an operation's photo was taken in daylight. In the face of such major discrepancies, the FSB stuck to their story. It was sugar, sugar. As for the explosion of the detonator, there wasn't any detonator at all. They bought three batteries in a shop, a shotgun cartridge, wires and all the rest, made a mock-up and put it on the bags of sugar. The FSB spokesman tries to cover every point like a report, but he doesn't mention the most important part of the detonator, the electronic watch. And furthermore, as the explosives expert Kachenko stated, the detonator was not placed on the bags. There were three bags. The one in the middle had a hole in it. There was an electronic watch inside with wires coming off it. I put my hands in and started gently taking the wires out of the bag. There's one surefire way of blocking investigation. Turn to the official secrets laws. We have people on our secret staff, but we never show them. The pictures we released, when they related the details, were taken from behind. But by all means, show them again. Don't bother. According to what the boss of your investigative department says, there was a cartridge, an imitation detonator. So why didn't Sergeyev figure out it was a mock-up? Stop trying to pull the wool over our eyes. Let's start from the fact that they told us it was sugar in the bags. Does this mean that neither the FSB specialists nor the Interior Ministry know what sugar looks like? People who've seen hexogen just once in their lives could never take it for sugar. You just have to put a bit on your tongue and taste it. You can tell in a couple of seconds. There are no explosives with a sweet taste. Could the evaporation detector have mistaken sugar for hexogen? No, it's not possible. And yet, an analysis that requires just a few minutes was dragged out for six months in the FSB laboratories. As soon as the investigation's over, I'm prepared to meet you again and give all the details. When might that be? That I can't say. How can it take several months to analyze sugar? Well, there's a cue, you know the way it is. In its efforts to be seen to be doing everything by the book, the FSB went to the point of absurdity. 
The bags that the FSB claims contained sugar, that we're convinced contained hexogen, were confiscated. And then it was announced that the bags were undergoing further analysis. Now, if it is sugar, and we're sure of that, why do we need this analysis? And after that, they were blown up in a safe zone. But if you know it's sugar, why do you need to blow it up? A bombing attempt or a blundered exercise? The FSB continued to serve up explanations with no apparent concern for how ridiculous this sometimes appeared. The material evidence in this inquiry is sealed in this bag. We can't open it without the permission of a judge. But we brought it with us especially to show that it was properly documented and all is on the record. So there's no question you can go on saying it's explosive when it's sugar. The FSB are watertight against investigation. Once again, when the chips were down, they resorted to their final protection, state secrecy. I repeat, we're a secret service and as such we use all means at our disposal in the law to carry out operations that you're not aware of and shouldn't be aware of, apart from what's stipulated by the law. We're talking about state secrets. Even this is inaccurate. In the law on operational and investigative activity, not only is there no article about exercises, the word is not even mentioned. So the operation in Ryazan was clearly carried out on some other basis. I've been sitting here and I don't believe these fairy tales I've been hearing from the FSB. I'm an old military man too, retired with the rank of head of staff of an entire military unit. Do you know how many exercises I held in 28 years in the service? And now no one will believe you or believe in that sealed bag or those files with all your papers and analyses. No one will believe you. The idea of the exercises appeared after the public discovered that something was going on. Exercises have to be announced in advance because the public is involved with them. Because this is a civil defense exercise. I'm certain there weren't any civil defense exercises going on. If there had been an exercise, they would have presented us with mountains of paperwork signed by the top brass at the FSB. The fact is that this paperwork doesn't exist, because if it existed, they would have shown it to us. This proves, of course, that it wasn't an exercise. Apart from all that, in a country where bombs are already going off everywhere, where several apartment blocks have already been blown up, nobody with any common sense would hold exercises that were so similar to what happened in Moscow. Nobody would organize exercises in a country where a war was already going on. Remember that the NTV program was broadcast before the new president began tightening the screws, and the residents of Ryazan openly mocked the exercise version of events. Zdanovic, Sergeyev and the other gentlemen of the FSB are trying to convince us that it was an exercise, but we don't believe them. Is it because the citizens of Ryazan are too stupid, or is it because your lies are unconvincing? Alexander Badanov, who offered to help our film crew, had a bag of heroin planted in his pocket by FSB operatives. Then they threatened to take action against him if he met up with us. And the reception we were given in Ryazan in November 2001, two years after the memorable events there, was not very hospitable. We tried to interview one of the central characters, General Sergeyev. He refused, which is understandable. We hadn't arranged in advance to meet him. But that wasn't why our group had to leave Ryazan. As we left his office building, some men in civilian clothes took us to one side. They give us a long-winded lecture on how the streets of Ryazan are unsafe, on the rampant criminality in the town and on the dangerous driving habits of certain local hoodlums. They asked us, if anything happened to you, which it probably will, whose fault would it be? Later on, three months after this trip, Pavel Voloshin was interrogated by the police in Moscow. The only citizen of Ryazan who was not too afraid to be interviewed was Viktor Lazinsky. 
and that might have been because after what happened he was forced to emigrate to the USA. As the president of the Ryazan branch of the Helsinki Monitoring Group, he was given an unambiguous warning by the local FSB. It was obvious they were simply going to kill me. A local FSB agent would just go up to a down and out in the square and tell him, you see that guy with the beard, buying cucumbers at the greengrocers? He's bothering my wife. I'll give you a bottle of vodka and a packet of cash if you bash him on the head in a dark alley one night. Unfortunately, that's how the secret services have been doing their business for the past five years. There are no written orders, no paperwork, nothing to be stored in the archives. Just a corpse, some wino finished off with an ice pick. So were all these threats and persecutions triggered by a simple civil defense exercise in Ryazan? Or are the exercises continuing, but now all over the country? NTV's talk show was shot in an age that is now past, an age when people were not afraid to speak out. It's the same old story. They're trying to make us look like fools. The FSB themselves are investigating an FSB exercise. It'll be an open and shut case. It's a terrible thing to say, but I think it was all true and it wasn't an exercise. I don't understand why we allow ourselves to be led by the nose by these people. They're just trying to clean the filth off their uniform coats, but they're covered in filth underneath anyway. Who had the right to organize this operation? An operation involving civilians. Who had the right? Who gave the orders? Who had the right to give such orders? The president. Who else? Citizens may only be involved in exercises with their consent. Otherwise, no matter who took the decision, it's yet another infringement of the law. Let's just imagine that real explosives were planted and it was a real attempt at provocation in order to increase tension in the Caucasus and so on and so forth. Do we have any guarantee that we would have been given an accurate reply that the public would find convincing to the question of what had happened? I suspect, unfortunately, that we wouldn't. There's no secret about it. When the inquiry is over, you'll be able to ask all the questions you want, either yourselves or through a lawyer. And if you don't trust the security service, we'll answer to the public prosecutor. One more falsehood. After the broadcast, the citizens of Ryazan tried in vain to bring an action against the FSB. They got nowhere. Even though the criminal case was closed, it was classified as top secret in direct contravention of Article 7 of the Law on State Secrecy. This makes it illegal to classify as secret information on events which threaten the health and safety of the general public. Of course, these classifications remain in force for 75 years. So I don't think we're likely to learn what really happened for at least 75 years. The Russian parliament could intervene and see to it that the truth was known. That is why on the 18th of March 2000, two Yabloko party MPs, Yuri Shikoshikin and Sergei Ivanenko, demanded an inquiry into the revelations in the Novaya Gazeta newspaper. It was a fairly innocuous request. Look into a newspaper story and get answers to some questions about what happened and what didn't. Even this attempt met with violent rejection because it was seen, and rightly so, as an attempt at civil control over secret service activity. We haven't had an answer yet about whether it really was a terrorist attack that was thwarted or whether it was passed off as some sort of secret service operation, an exercise or whatever. It's a secret shrouded in darkness. We still don't have any reliable information on the matter. If the truth about the incident in Ryazan came out, the government would be forced to answer questions about who was behind the explosions in Bunaksk, Moscow and Volgodonsk. And that's something both former and present members of the Russian Special Services are agreed upon.
The entire history of the KGB is just full of this kind of activity. And in this context, I believe the incidents in Moscow and Volgodansk, and then later in Ryazan, that failed explosion, I believe they're all links in the same chain. The style used here is absolutely clear. The group looked around for the premises, preferably in the basement or a ground floor. They rented them under the guise of storage space for some kind of goods, and the explosive was shipped in. In a day, you could quite easily bring it in and set up the explosion. It was delivered disguised as bags of sugar. But if we assume that all the explosions in houses in 1999 were the work of the special services, clearly it must have taken several months to plan and prepare for them. And right up to August 1999, the FSB was headed by Vladimir Putin. Yes, of course, it's possible that the president and the top brass had nothing to do with it. And there could have been a group of patriotically inclined officers who planted bombs and blew up not just one house, but 10 or 15, taking the risk for the salvation of the state they love. One more question. The explosions have taken place, the so-called Ryazan exercises have been held, so now, why doesn't Putin, as president of the country, hold an investigation into what happened? I think the answer is obvious. Either he knows perfectly well what actually happened, or there is, in the final analysis, another global explanation, that Putin doesn't really control anything that happens in the country. Whether a special service plan to mobilize public opinion against Chechnya or a genuine anti-terrorist exercise, a genuine investigation of the 1999 bombings is too risky. If the inquiry were to establish that responsibility rests with the secret service, then the legitimacy of all those presently in power in Russia could be called into question.